but nothing like talking about sex at 30 in the morning. Uh, <laughs> start the semester with sex. <laughs> All right, good morning, everybody. Yeah, we enjoy all the rain. It was so nice. It rains so much. I love it. Right? I'm sad this one's out. It's going to go away, but it's not going to be for a little while. But uh, I'll pass it around. Um, we have a guest speaker today in the children's meet one. Um, I have to leave at like 8.55 for our interviews, but she's going to stay and uh, finish up the lecture. Make sure you're taking notes. I did post the slides for this as well for our slides and i'm recording this so um if you miss some of it or you want to watch it later you can do that as well uh but we are lucky to have jasmine here with us so um i'm going to sit over here and then i will quietly slip out at like 8 55 and i'll go make sure that you take my sweet thank you i forgot about it. i'll go check on that room. perfect good morning everyone how's it going it's going it's going you ready to talk about sex at 8 30 this morning <laughs> yeah who's not ready all right um, so my name is Jasmine. I'm the health educator at the Student Health Center. Does everyone know about the Student Health Center? I know we've done some sticker posing back there. Yeah, <laughs> we have some fun stickers um, and things like that. But so we'll talk about the Student Health Center kind of a little bit more to at the end. But it is a really great resource for all of you as students, especially as we talk about sexual health and STIs, because you have access to lots of really great things through the Student Health Center. So before I like jump into the bulk of the presentation, I like to do like my little disclaimer, right? I try not to like over scar people with like only terrible graphics of like, this is an STI, but there's some graphic images, right? And then also just talking about sex in general, um, some people may find something triggering or something like that. You're always welcome to step out. Just let me know that you're okay. Um, and then also, like, it's always a really good thing to mention that, yes, this is an STI presentation, and we're going to talk about uh, safer sex practices and all of that. It doesn't mean that everyone is sexually active or has interest in being sexually active. So hopefully, this is still like an informative presentation for everyone. Um, and then I like to have fun, as you notice, like, I've made all my slides like neon and everything. So I'm like, I, this doesn't need to be like this terrible conversation, but it's still a serious topic. So we'll have fun with it, but it is still important. So before I jump into the STIs and all that good stuff, I think it's really important. Like I said, I try to look at this from a more sexual health perspective. And so I like to include a definition of what sexual health is. And so this is from the World Health Organization. And the WHO defines sexual health as a state of physical, mental, and social well-being in relation to sexuality. It requires a positive and respectful approach to sexuality and sexual relationships, as well as a possibility of having pleasurable and safe sexual experiences free of coercion, discrimination, and violence. So in my usual presentation, I talk about like consent and all that as well, but this one's, we're just going to really focus on STIs, safer sex practices. Um, but with that, I always also like to add that sexuality, sex, gender, all of that plays into these conversations. So I try to make this as inclusive as possible. All forms of sex are on the table. We can talk about it. We're going to talk about different ways of transmission for STIs. But I will say that a lot of sexual health terminology is pretty like anatomically based on like a binary, right? Like male, female. And so there may be some things that aren't as inclusive as I would like them to be. But like I said, I do my best to try to make it inclusive and just know if there's something that's not, it's just referring to anatomical sex for this purpose. Um, and then also sex is very different for people. It varies by culture, identity, and all of that good stuff. So we want to be as respectful as possible throughout this presentation. So I want to know, like, so in the past, what has learning about sexual health looked like for you or STIs or any of that? What's your, what's your background? Just so I kind of can gauge where everyone's at. It's going to be like high school classes, whatever. <laughs> high school, how were the high school classes? Yeah. High school, that teacher complained that he wasn't allowed to bring a condom in to show us. Okay, not allowed. Well, I always have, I have condoms and you can. Can practice anytime you want at the health center. It's one of my uh, activities I do for outreach. So stop by anytime you want some practice. You think I'm joking, but like I would say 80% of people use a condom wrong. So just saying. Um, 
what else? What has it been like learning about sexual health in the past? Or what do you, is there anything you feel like is missing from STI conversations? Yeah. I think um, when we were younger, it was more like, uh, like on and, uh, yeah. And yeah. 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 Definitely. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's a hundred percent absolute process. Yeah. Definitely. So what with that, do you think any like do you feel like any parts missing for you? What would you like to know the most today? So as I go through this, I can make sure I kind of cater it towards that. I promise it'll be probably a lot more graphic than high school, but <laughs> a lot more open conversation. Nothing, nothing. All right. Well, we'll see at the end. We'll check back in at the end. Um, so today, like I said, here's our agenda. We're first going to cover STIs. We're not going to cover every single STI under the sun, but we're going to cover a lot of the I don't want to say popular ones, but I guess the popular ones. And then we're going to talk about safer sex practices. Again, I know that everyone has sex in different ways, and then some people aren't sexually active, but this is not going to be just like an abstinence only presentation. So we're going to get into um, ways to have safer sex. So another reason why, like, yes, I do have some graphic images, but I don't like to just have like 100 slides of really terrible pictures is because 80% of the people who have an STI don't show any symptoms. So I think it can actually kind of lead to this like misnomer that like if you have an STI, it's going to look like this terrible picture where like parts look like they're falling off and everything else. And yes, yeah, sometimes STIs can cause that, but 80% of people have no symptoms at all. And so that's what's really important to think about. Going back to the Student Health Center, we have free STI testing. So most students qualify under Family Pact. And so if you qualify for Family Pact, which we help you get all set up, it's free STI testing, uh, free sexual health care. So something to keep in mind. The most common STIs among college students are HPV, chlamydia, and herpes. So we're definitely gonna cover those today. With that, we'll jump right into chlamydia. So <laughs> chlamydia is spread through vaginal, anal, and oral sex. So that's another really big thing I think sometimes is left out of like sexual health presentations. It tends to talk about like just, you know, like vaginal sex with a penis and that's it. And that's how you spread an STI. But chlamydia is actually carried in semen, in pre-ejaculation fluid, and in vaginal fluids. And so it can actually infect the penis, vagina, cervix, anus, urethra, eyes, and throat. So it is actually something that can be spread multiple ways, and it can lead to infertility if left untreated. So specifically um, for people with a uterus, it can lead to infertility. So here's some of our graphic pictures. Not too bad, though, right? <laughs> so a lot of people have no symptoms. There's zero symptoms of chlamydia. But some of the common symptoms, if someone does have symptoms, include burning with urination, pain with sex, discharge, bleeding between periods, um, but it often goes unnoticed because symptoms can be really vague or absent. So just to walk through some of these images here. So this is like discharge from a penis. So that can be one sign of chlamydia or just in general, like vaginal discharge that's different. Um, this is actually a cervix that's been infected. So um, cervix, not super easy to see, right? Unless you are in a clinical setting. And that's why, again, a lot of times STIs go unnoticed. So how do we test for chlamydia? So a urine sample is one of the really common ways that chlamydia is tested for. It can also be uh, visualized or tested during a pap test. And there, depending on where someone thinks it may be infected, there can be site testing. So specifically like oral chlamydia or rectal or if it's genital. Treatment, good news clears up with antibiotics, but it's really important to test and treat partners as well. So that's a really big thing across the board with STIs is kind of like, we've heard a lot of contact tracing with COVID, right? Like who have you been exposed to this and that? Well, STIs are also really important for contact tracing. So partners need to be treated and anyone else that either the partners have been with also need to be treated. There's actually some really interesting laws coming into place and everything with treatment. So um, I believe in California, they're working on if you have a partner who you know could be infected with like chlamydia, uh, but they will not see a doctor, they can't access a doctor or a site, some physicians will actually write antibiotic prescriptions for them without seeing them. So it's one of those barrier methods that physicians are looking at like removing 
um, to make sure everyone's treated. So now let's get into HPV, human papilloma virus. Who's heard of HPV before? Where have we heard of it mostly? Or what do we think of with it? All the commercials maybe for like Gardasil, all of that. Yeah. So this is something that I think a lot of people have heard of and it's super, super common. There's more than 200 types of HPV viruses. So that's like a lot. Um, and about 40 of them are the kind that can infect the genital area. So of the 200 type, not all of them are considered like the genital version of HPV, 40 are. Um, and these kinds of HPV are spread during sexual contact. Again, it's like, it can be any type of sexual contact. Um, there, the other forms of HPV can cause like common warts, like hand warts or like foot warts, but the, those aren't the types of HPV that are sexually transmitted. So they're different virus strains. And then there's two types. So specifically type six and 11 cause most cases of genital warts. And at least 12 types can cause some type of cancer, right? So that's the big thing when we see with all the advertisement and everything else. A large part of it is this prevention of cancer. And there's two particular strains. So type 16 and 18 are the majority uh, the cases that cause cancer. So 16 and 18 lead to the most forms of cancer. Cervical cancer is the most commonly linked to HPV, but HPV can also cause cancer in the vulva, vagina, penis, anus, mouth, and throat. So it's not only cervical cancer that it can cause. Again, super, super common, about 43 million HPV infections in 2018, according to the CDC. Um, another statistic said something like about 80% of people have some strain of an HPV virus in their life. For a lot of people, it clears up. Um, and they never know, or they may not know unless they're tested, something like that. But it spreads uh, relatively easily just from skin to skin contact. So we're gonna talk about that later when we get into kind of like safer sex practices. Barrier methods are always great for protecting for STIs, but they're not 100% effective. And that's especially because certain viruses like HPV can spread through that close skin to skin contact. And so, that means that you can get it when you have any contact between vulva, vagina, cervix, penis, anus, um, any genitals touching, mouth, uh, throat. So it's very commonly and easily spread through sexual practice. And it can it can spread even if there's like not necessarily like, oh, someone finished or something like that. It's not just like a, a seminal fluid type of um, STI. It is skin to skin. So here are some of the pictures for HPV, right? It can cause genital warts. So here we have around the head of the penis and the vagina, so genital warts. But a lot of people, again, they don't know they have an infection until maybe they get like an abnormal pap test. Who knows what age it's recommended for pap test? Do we know what a pap test is too? And we'll talk about it a little bit more. So yeah. Isn't it 21? So now it's just recommended at 21, even without like sexual intercourse, which I'm glad you brought up. So that's a good one. So it's supposed to be. So if you have a cervix, 21 is when you should start getting pap tested. Yep. Definitely by then. But yes, if you have sexual intercourse younger, then it's also good to talk to your provider if you should have it before then. So excellent. I was like that. That's a good one to know. Um, and then again, so sometimes it can be detected in a pap test or like by symptoms. So if someone shows up with warts, they can be small. It doesn't, again, it doesn't necessarily have to be like where you have this whole covering of warts. It can be one or two. Um, it can also kind of be misunderstood for something else. Like if it's just like, oh, one little bump, what is that? Um, so that's why it's always best to have a good sexual health care provider. So testing, again, most commonly tested during a pap test or visualization, so going in and seeing a wart, but there's actually no like FDA approved testing for men or people with a penis. So this is all based off of like visualization then. Um, and again, that's why we saw like a lot of prevention is key, right? So vaccinations, a lot of commercials 
for the HPV vaccine. And so I just included a little chart. It used to be way more specific. Like they had like these really limited windows and like if you missed it, like you missed it, you didn't get vaccinated, but they're actually changing a lot of clinical recommendations. And again, like having that conversation with your, your healthcare provider, even if you've missed certain windows, they may indicate like it's best to still get vaccinated. So the really cool thing is since we've had HPV vaccines, HPV cancer and genital warts have dropped 88% among teen girls and 81% among young adult women. So that's like super like win for health, right? <laughs> really cool. Um, but there's no treatment for the virus itself. So it's something that either clears from the body or it can be something that like continually needs monitoring. If someone does have genital warts, sometimes they do go away on their own without treatment. But if you do see a healthcare provider, they can also remove it. And there's different ways. So like cryotherapy, they basically can like freeze it off or they can like surgically remove it. So it can be removed. Um, also, like if there's a point where there's concern about precancer, treatments are available. So again, no cure for the virus, but we do have treatments. Um, and if it has progressed to cancer, Again, the sooner found, the easier it is to treat. So that's why we recommend everyone stays up to date on all of their screenings and everything else. All right, on to herpes. <laughs> so herpes is the other super, super common STI. The virus itself stays in your body for life. So this isn't one that can like that goes away or anything like that. More than half of Americans have oral herpes. So there's actually two strains of herpes. There's HSV-1 and HSV-2. So HSV-1 is known as oral herpes. This is like if you see someone with like a cold sore or something like that. And then HSV-2 is known as uh, genital herpes, but HSV-1 and HSV-2 are intertransmittable, meaning oral herpes can be spread to the genital region, and genital herpes can be spread to the oral region. So that's like, what? <laughs> what? So we'll get more into that. But it can cause sores, and that can pop up like anywhere, anywhere, right? It can pop up the mouth, anywhere around the genital region. Um, and I think the biggest thing, like I said, that surprises people is that like oral herpes, half of people have it, can spread to the genital region. So it's spread through skin to skin contact. So it's another STI that's not just like sexual fluids. Um, it can spread from skin to skin contact. And so this is like the long list of like basically everything we just covered of how it could be transmitted back and forth, right? So anyone who has a virus or a sore, you can get it through oral sex. You can get it through other forms of sex. You can get it from skin in a certain region, touching with other skin. Um, so I'm just going to leave all that list to the imagination, of the ways it can spread. So symptoms, again, some people have no symptoms. So um, this is something too that is like often called like, oh, there's outbreaks and this and that when people actually actively have sores, but in between there can be no symptoms or people can have kind of a more, uh, not dormant, but like a, a virus in their body that hasn't caused symptoms yet for a while. But most common symptoms is like itchy and painful blisters. So these are different. So this would be like a blister on the mouth versus like in other regions that you can get it. And they can break and turn into sores, but it can look a lot like other skin problems. So again, if you're not having like a massive outbreak, it can be like, oh, is that like an ingrown hair or some like contact dermatitis or like what's going on there, um, some acne. And so that's why, again, it's really important to make sure you're getting screened for STIs. So symptoms, um, there can be burning when you pee. And often that's because there's an actual sore like in the urethra. So that's why that burns. Um, you can also have trouble peeing because when you think about the outbreak and that causes some inflammation or if you have sores again around the urethra, uh, it can feel difficult to pee. Uh, you can have pain in the region of the outbreak, itching. Um, for HSV2 specifically, you can have like swollen glands. And so again, that's like your body trying to work. You know, like anytime you're harboring an infection of some sort, often your immune system kicks in. So you can have swollen glands. Um, so those are usually like your lymph nodes that would swell. Fever, chills, headaches, 
uh, feeling achy and tired. So some people often describe like they'll get like a headache before they end up with like a even a cold sore, right? Like people are like, oh, I had this really bad headache and then I had a cold sore. So it's that whole viral process. So testing is visualization. Uh, so seeing like, yeah, that's a that's a sore. Culture, they can culture it. So culture the fluids to see what it is. And they can do a blood test. So they can actually see like if you have HSV1 or HSV2 or both through a blood test. And so that's going to look for like the viral levels and all that good stuff. Oops, don't want to go to gonorrhea yet. So there's currently no cure for herpes, but there's a lot of medications that can help prevent or reduce outbreaks. So a lot of the ones when it's like no cure, it's like, oh, right, it feels like super dramatic, but with like a good healthcare team, there's a lot that can be done to manage it. And again, a lot of these are super common, so it helps to talk about it, helps to have uh, those conversations with your healthcare provider. And there's also ointments that can like make the sores heal faster and hurt less. Now on to gonorrhea. <laughs> so gonorrhea is an STD that can cause infections in the genitals, rectum, and throat. So it is very common, especially among 15 to 24 year olds. So often, sometimes you'll see those public health announcements and there's like, or the flyers in the bathroom, it's like current gonorrhea outbreak, like things like that. Because it is a pretty common one, especially around the like, typical college age, right? So or 15 to 24 year olds. Symptoms for this, um, a lot of times discharge is one of the bigger symptoms if you're going to be symptomatic. Again, we talked about it can be oral or genital. So you can actually get like a throat infection of gonorrhea um, and it can cause pain or burning when peeing. So Pain and burning when peeing in general, good time to see a healthcare provider, right? Most of these had that as a symptom. There can be increased vaginal discharge, vaginal bleeding between periods. Um, again, discharge, big one. Uh, painful or swollen testicles is not super common, but it is a potential symptom. Um, depending on where the infection is, since it can be transmitted like anally as well, there can be anal itching, soreness, bleeding, or painful bowel movements. So testing, it's a urine test and then swab depending on location. So again, STIs can be transmitted in multiple places. So we always wanna make sure that we are like talking with our healthcare provider about like the type of sexual intercourse we have, because that can help with knowing where testing needs to happen. Treatment, it is treatable with antibiotics. However, gonorrhea is one of the ones where we're seeing is having more drug resistant strains. So has anyone heard of like drug resistant antibiotic issues? What do we know about it? Yeah. Yes. So similar, yeah. So like the antibiotics is like virus can be treated with antibiotics, but I get what you're saying with mutation. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. 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 So yeah. So I actually like I had just done like an antibiotic like cold flu outreach a couple weeks ago, and like I put safer sex practices in there, which you don't think here's like cold flu, COVID, use a condom, right? Because it's like, we want to make sure that when we, we don't take antibiotics for viral infections, like the flu or COVID, because it, it does uh, decrease the ability for antibiotics to work when we need it for something like an STI. And then also in general, safer sex practices. So you're not spreading as many STIs. Um, you speak out of yeah. Yeah. No, you're good. <laughs> I mean, she said it was fine. Oh, sleeping. Sure. Yeah, no, no, no. Oh, good. Um, and then, so it's it's really important in general to know when we need antibiotics and all of that. But in general, gonorrhea can be treated with antibiotics, but there are some more resistant strains. And the reason I say that is because if you go to get treated for gonorrhea and symptoms aren't improving, it's important to go back because maybe then it has to be like cultured specifically to know what type of antibiotic will treat it best. 
So the last one we're going to talk about today for SCIs is HIV, which is human immunodeficiency virus. Have most of us heard of HIV? So HIV is an important one to talk to because there are also like, there's a lot of stereotypes around HIV, and I think that's really important to address. Um, but approximately 1.2 million people in the U.S. have HIV. And of that, about 13% don't know they have it. So they haven't been tested for it. So that's a pretty big chunk. If you think about like, that's more than one in 10 people with HIV don't know they have it. HIV continues to have a disproportionate impact on certain populations. So we see racial disparities with HIV. We see, um, we know that like gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men are disproportionately impacted by HIV. So that goes back to kind of like early on when we talked about, it's important to think about how all these other factors play into STIs. But there's still about 34,800 new HIV infections in the United States a year. So that was back in 2019. In 2020, so MSM stands for men who have sex with men, uh, accounted for 71% of new HIV diagnosis, but 22% of new HIV cases were in people who only have heterosexual uh, contact for sex. So again, when we saw we only like a lot of students will say like, oh no, that's only like if you're a man who's a man, that's the only person who has to worry about HIV. That's not true. Like that's one in five cases, right? So 20%, one in five cases is not within that population. And then in 2019, of females who contracted HIV, 83% identified as heterosexual. So really important to think about. Everyone has to be protected and safe from it. Um, the good news is we have a lot more education and we're spreading a lot more awareness on it. So from 2015 to 2019, among like young men who have sex with men, the we saw the infection rate drop 33%. So that's super good. So yay, there's a lot of campaign and awareness around it. Um, and that's kind of the goal. So symptoms really vary. And this isn't like one that usually just like pops up and all of a sudden, you know, right? So stage one can be flu-like symptoms. So it's often like unknown. We go back to like about, you know, 13% don't know they have the infection. A lot of people, you feel like I got a cold, I got whatever, that's that. You don't think of an STI. In stage two, this is where like we call it a chronic HIV infection. And that can last like 10 to 15 years without treatment. Like people can have this kind of low chronic level. Um, we're definitely doing more now to like extend this period. Stage three is known as like what people refer to as AIDS or acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. And this is where it's impacted the body more. And so we're going to see other kind of more chronic illness symptoms like pneumonia, sores, things like that. So testing, there's a lot of really cool and free ways to get tested. Like county has free testing programs. There are free um, at, well, not necessarily free, but there are at-home testing kits. So the only FDA approved self-test is an antibody test. Antibodies tests look for antibodies in the uh, blood or oral fluid. So some tests are like a cheek swab, some are like a finger prick, and then some are like an actual blood draw. So I won't make you like, like read through every single one of these, right? But we've got antibody tests, we've got antigen tests. And so that looks for HIV antibodies and antigens. And then we have nucleic acid tests. And this is when we actually want to know the exact viral load. So instead of of like, yes, you're positive or negative, like what is the viral load in the blood? And that's important because, has anyone heard of U equals U? No, no. So undetectable equals untransmittable. So that's like a really big campaign. And so people who are on proper medications, if they are HIV positive, they can actually get to an undetectable level of HIV on a lab test. And undetectable means untransmittable. So it's not the same transmission that you would have if you had the viral load, right? And so a lot of ways too that we're working on treatment is prevention. Has anyone heard of PEP or PrEP? If anyone, yeah, does anyone wanna share what one or both are? Oh, I've seen like a lot of- The commercials? Yeah, yeah. I guess it just brings that down to that. Okay. Anyone else have anything to add? The commercials, right? You got the commercial. I want to share a fun fact, though. 
So you know the United States and I believe it's the Netherlands are the only two countries where pharmaceuticals can advertise to the public. Yeah, yeah. fascinating. This is my fun fact. Sorry, I'm a public health person. <laughs> Anyone else know PrEP or PEP or what it maybe stands for? So PrEP is pre-exposure prophylactics. And so this may be if someone has a partner who's HIV positive, or if they know like, yeah, I often have like unprotected sex or multiple partners, all of that. Um, it can be beneficial again with a healthcare provider to decide like, I'm going to go on PrEP and that kind of reduces your chance of getting the virus if exposed. There's also PEP, which is post-exposure prophylaxis. So let's say like, oh, I think I may have been exposed. There's a certain window you can take this. And again, it works to reduce the chances of actually uh, contracting the virus. So really cool stuff. So in general, if you have the virus, you go on like what's called ART, um, which is like a antiretroviral therapy. And so that is like helps to bring the levels down to an undetectable level. If you don't have the virus, that's where PEP or PrEP are an option. So really cool stuff uh, that's out there and kind of progress we're making. Other STI. As we're not going to talk about, right, these are the main ones. We kind of, a lot of them, too, just can cause, like, specific symptoms. So people say, like, vaginosis, things like that. Um, I think we did a pretty good list, though. Do we feel like we've got our STIs down? Ready to <laughs> got those covered? Was it too scarring? Too many images that were terrible? Good. Um, so little, we'll just do our little uh, midpoint check-in before we get into barrier methods. But of the STIs, which are the non curable ones. Yeah. HIV, HIV non-curable. Herpes, Herpes non-curable. There's four all overall, but only three we talked about today. If you get three, I'll be super stoked. Herpes, HIV. Yeah. Chlamydia. Chlamydia is curable with antibiotics. Good recap. Let's recap them all. Yeah. I mean, like, oh. Are you saying like AIDS? So HIV, that counts all under the one. Okay. Yeah. HIV, herpes. Yeah. Yep. What's the one that Gardasil's HPV. Yeah. So the four uncurable or non curable are the four H's. So HPV, herpes, and HIV. We didn't talk about hepatitis, but technically hepatitis C can be transmitted through sexual activity. So now you always remember the four H's, right? So non-curable, but treatable. And I think that's the big thing we need to talk about, right? Treatable. All right. Who's ready to get in safe for sex practices? We're doing it whether you're ready or not. So <laughs> um, again, really big thing to talk about. A lot of this is really gendered, right? We talk about sexual health and gender. It's super gendered. Genitals don't equal gender. Uh, we're not going to spend so much time talking about pregnancy prevention because this is more like an STI and safer sex practice as far as STIs, but it's also important to know your risk for pregnancy. So egg plus sperm equals chance of pregnancy. In general, contraception though, like I'm just going to do like a two slide <laughs> on contraception. So there's birth control pills, there's uh, IUDs, vaginal rings, injectables, implant, patch, condoms. There's other ones. If you have questions about birth control or contraception, our student health center is really great. They can uh, they can definitely get through several of these things like implants and stuff they don't do, but we work with like places that we can refer you out or help you with. So it's if you have any questions about contraception, student health center is your place. All the and then there's always free condoms. So that's kind of a win right there. You just walk in, grab a bag. So when we look at birth control in general, right, we're not going to talk about all of them, but what I do want to emphasize is there's tons of birth control methods, but only condoms, so external condoms and internal condoms, uh, really protect against STIs to some level. So when we're looking at this screen, um, it's important to not only think about risk of pregnancy, but STI prevention. So some more, right, so this is kind of like the most effective to least effective. So what's really interesting is condoms, like external condoms are about 87% effective. 
do we know why it's only 87% when like a lot of times people are like they're 98% effective? Yeah. Is that like um inadvertency? Yep, user error. User error drops the effectiveness a lot. So um it's really important to, like I said, know how to use a condom appropriately. There's other methods. Again, a lot of the ones that like are, you know, withdraw, like not super effective. Um Monthly planning, not super effective. So important to think about. So we're gonna talk about barrier methods. We're gonna talk about a lot of different barrier methods. Some of you may have heard of, some of you never may have heard of. So we're gonna talk about internal and external condoms. Has anyone heard about internal condoms? It's only external. I'm seeing some faces like, no, what the hell? <laughs> and then we're gonna talk about dental dams and other ones. Uh, my goal is always to teach like, if you were gonna be as safe as possible, these are all the methods you can do. What you do, of course, is always up to you. So again, barrier methods are not 100% effective in preventing STIs, uh, specifically like HPV, syphilis, herpes, things like that are spread through skin-to-skin -skin contact, like close genital skin-to-skin -skin contact. So when you think about it, um, you know, unless you're covering literally everything, <laughs> you can't necessarily guarantee that you're not going to spread an STI. So who knows what this type of condom is? Yeah, so this is an internal condom. So if you've never seen one before, here you go. So we have external condoms, internal condoms. Often just external condoms are just called condoms. They don't like get called external condoms, but internal condoms like, oh, it's an internal condom. And we'll kind of cover the uses for those. So I like to share some fun facts about condoms. Um, fun is all interpretive, but hey, <laughs> condoms have sizes. So this is like a really important thing we'll talk about too. Um, they should never hurt. So sometimes with this, oh no, I can't use a condom like it hurts. Check the size, check the ingredients. Um, some people have allergies to latex or something like that. So, you know, if you're getting a reaction every time, yeah, that would hurt. <laughs> Change the type of condom. Uh, the type can also make a difference. Like there are literally, like there's places you can find like 70 different types of condoms. So a lot of options out there. Uh, and also the amount of lube being used can all like reduce if there's discomfort, right? Condoms should never hurt. So condoms are about that 86, 87% effective against preventing HIV, STIs, and pregnancy. If used correctly, they're 98% effective against, 98% uh, effective against pregnancy. But again, a lot of user error. There's vegan condoms. So if anyone's, you know, vegan and concerned about that, there's vegan condoms as a vegan. <laughs> condoms do expire. This is a very big one. Condoms expire. Make sure you're not using expired condoms. Also, like another thing we get a lot is like, oh, well, condoms are just too small. Condoms can stretch like three feet. <laughs> so I'm gonna just pause there for a minute. Like, three feet. I've had people who have literally stretched it like past their elbow. So they, again, their sizes. And then also though, sometimes people say like, oh no, the condom's too big. They do make various sizes. So if someone really was like, oh, I find like a smaller condom, onecondom.com has very, like there's 50 sizes of condoms there. So that's pretty cool. Um, the stores have fewer options, but there are size options. Another just random fact in case you're ever on like sexual health trivia, but condoms can hold nearly one gallon of liquid. So people will make water balloons out of them and then like they're literally like giant um, and they don't break very easily. So there used to be videos like people would do that. They'd fill it with water and throw it at someone. It just like bounces off of them. It's like really not, not right. <laughs> um, and then the biggest thing is like never use two condoms simultaneously. Why? Like the friction between them just causes. Yeah. So people are like, I'm gonna double up or I'm gonna use an external and internal. No, less effective. Don't do that. <laughs> so they can break. So uh condom sizes do matter for STI protection. A lot of times, if uh too big of a condom is used, that can lead to like semen leaking out or slipping off. So um if you want to check out all the ways to different size tests a condom, there's tons of resources to do so. But most things just try and like start with a regular condom. Does it slip off? Does it feel too tight? 
go from there. So these are like the four most common sizes found in stores. But like I said, there's there's a lot of options. So is, can anyone walk me through or tell me the process of like how like step by step, like tell me how to use an external condom? This is where we start to get less comfortable. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That is very, very accurate. Anything else? Yeah. Yep. So before that, pinch the condom to check to make sure there's still an air pocket. So like people will leave it in a wallet or a purse or be like, oh, someone poked a hole, like all those things. Air pocket. Check it. Anything else? That is it. Those are those are coming a lot. I'm like getting very nitpicky here, but like I said, user error. So um, you're always gonna wanna check the expiration date. The very first thing you should do is check the expiration date. So condoms to expire, then you check the air pocket. Um, make sure it hasn't been stored in like a hot place. So people leave it in like the car or something like that. It's like during summer, cars just like 110 inside. Not a great life for a condom. Makes them less effective. So make sure it's not stored in like a wallet or a car. Check the expiration date. Check for that air pocket. And then yes, you'll pinch the tip. The biggest thing too is like, so I did an outreach where I had people put condoms on like a wooden penis and like several people put the condom on back. So it's a thing. So condoms roll a certain direction. So you're always gonna wanna test that out. Like what way does it roll naturally? The other way, like, I don't know, but they were like forced it down and it somehow unrolled slightly. But yeah, so check to make sure the condom's rolling the correct direction. Roll it all the way down, like as far as you can. So that's another one, people don't roll it all the way down. Um, so, but overall I'd say we got most of them. So good job team. Internal condoms, a lot of people have never seen an internal condom. So they can be used for uh, vaginal or, or anal sex. So I think the really important thing too is like a lot of people talk about like, oh, I have a partner and they refuse to use a condom. And so it's like, there's also ways that you can think about protecting yourself, right? So um, vaginal condoms, you just follow the steps here, right? They're very much, they're kind of like a really big condom and then they have like a ring at the bottom. So if you're using it for vaginal sex, like it just literally inserts in and then you make sure to leave the outside ring outside. For anal sex, they usually recommend taking out the inner ring. So same thing though, you leave the outer ring there. Um, and so again, it's just another way to protect yourself, not to double up, <laughs> but to protect yourself if you feel like that's the best way for you. Um, yep. So those are the main ones there. So now they're harder to find. They're also more expensive. So it's like if you're having sexual intercourse with someone or an option is an external condom for uh, one of the partners, that's usually like cheaper and slightly more effective, but internal condoms are also an option. So dental dams, has anyone ever heard of a dental dam? So again, they're like pretty expensive. Like if you go to the store for a dental dam, they're like really expensive. But dental dams are latex or polyurethane sheets. And you can use it for like any form of oral sex, essentially, like especially like between as a barrier between a vagina or an anus. Um, you can purchase them in stores online. And then you want to like use sometimes like a lube to hold it down so it's not like moving everywhere. Um, there's also like this company called Laurels. I just threw this in there because like I learned about this and it's like underwear with a built-in dental dam. So it's a thing for sure. But I like to, since they are expensive and not super common to find, you can actually turn a condom into a dental dam. So if you unroll a condom, and you cut off the tip, and then you can cut off like the end too if you want. Like that seems a little aggressive. They take off like a third of it, but you know it's fine. And then you just cut it down the middle. You just made a dental dam. So if you don't have access to dental dams, condoms work. I'd probably not use a lubricated condom though because you know. But um, you can use lube still to hold it down. You can use flavored condoms. People can use people use saran wrap as long as it's non microwavable. So. If you want to like get different colors, saran wrap, you know, have some fun with it. Tons of options. Maybe like the holiday pattern. You got options. 
But um, again, a, an affordable way to create your own dental dam is by using a condom. Yeah. So I'm not a hundred percent sure on like the scientific backing of that, but I know like, so like in general, pH balance is very sensitive. And so like, I think for each person, they kind of uh, like want to know that because like different lubes, different, any, like some people have reactions to flavored condoms or like different like lubes that are like, oh, this is like a tingly, this or that, like it can really mess with some people. So I will look into the scientific backing of that, but um, I would just say in general, like, it's a, it's a delicate ecosystem. <laughs> it's a very delicate ecosystem. So that's a really great question. I will get back to you with the scientific data on it. Um, but yeah, so we're going to also just like, like I said, we're going to cover everything. So we're going to go through like different forms of oral sex, right? So if you're having oral sex and a penis is involved, condoms, a great option. Uh, vagina or anus, dental dams, a great option. Saran wrap is an option, you know, it's better than nothing. But these are actually like what dental dams like look like in the store. Um, but like I said, they're kind of hard to find. Again, a lot of STIs can be passed through oral sex. So chlamydia, gonorrhea, HPV, herpes. So I know like it's a lot of people are kind of like laugh at the dental dam, all that, right? But at least it's a barrier, it's a protection. Um, syphilis can also be spread, HIV can be spread. Uh, we talked about herpes, HSV-1 and HSV-2 interchangeable. So if you can use some sort of protection, it helps. If you're having sex with like toys and stuff, the big, like this is considered a lower risk spread of STI, but the biggest risk comes from sh sharing toys. So if you're sharing toys between partners, that's still swapping, right? Fluids, everything. So you always want to make sure to clean toys. Um, going back to pH balance, like uh, soap and water tends to be the best way, right? Soap, warm water, follow the instruction guide though. Certain toys can respond to different things. But sometimes like people have used like the fancy toy cleaners and then they get a reaction from that. So make sure like soap and water is usually the recommended. If you plan on switching people, you can always use a condom over a toy. So at least that's like one way then you take the condom off you switch the condom like that's one better step than just like swapping it um and if you switch from like vaginal to anal penetration always clean the toy that's like a really good way to spread like infections back and forth utis things like that so always clean it and then if using a toy for anal sex always make sure the toy is anal safe because it is like a vacuum system if it is not it can go it can go up and end up in an er trip so that is not a joke um, so always make sure it's anal safe. And then again, it's considered a lower risk STI practice, but you can spread STIs from sharing sex toys. Anal sex, use a condom and lube is really important. Um, HPV can spread through anal sex. So that's something some people don't know. Also chlamydia, herpes, gonorrhea, hepatitis, HIV, syphilis, um, and the lack of lubrication can cause like skin tears. So it's it's easier to tear the skin there, which makes you more susceptible to infection. So that's why I like condoms plus lube. And then just once again, make sure the toy is anal safe if using a toy. Um, there's other, again, like people say like low risk, but anything like whether you wanna call it grinding, scissoring, humping, whatever, right? This is like a non-penetrative necessarily uh, form of sex. Anytime there's contact between genitals, like there's a risk of STIs. So especially if it's like uh, vulva vulva contact, you can get HPV is a big one, gonorrhea, chlamydia with body fluid exchanged. Um, in general, like I said, right, even if there's no penetration, it can spread STIs. You can use a dental dam for like, so if it was like two, and again, it looks like what? <laughs> but like, let's say it's, you know, like two people with vaginas, it, they, you can use a dental dam and hold it in place with lube. It's not like the most ideal, but it does create some barrier. And again, there's underwear that has built-in dental dams. And then vagina and penis, right? Condoms are very important. Um, and then additional birth control methods if needed. I also wanted to bring up like, so some people have uh, who use testosterone, so maybe they were 
assigned female at birth and then they're transitioning and so on testosterone the clitoris can actually grow to like two to three inches and so this can like create like some people are like okay if it's a size where like a small condom fits but some people that doesn't fit or it doesn't work and then the dental dam can like slip or move or it's not as effective so one option and again like you always want to go with what the best option is for like you and then what works um, if condoms aren't an option, though, some people make what they call a cape and you take a glove and you essentially like cut, uh, cut the fingers out except for the thumb and make like a cape. So it forms some form of protection. So that's used for what like a lot of people refer to as a T penis. And so also, I think what's really important with all of this is like to make a plan. So I have lots of like sexual health brochures that cover everything from like consent to combos. So like these conversations can be awkward. Um, and then it gets even harder when you're like in the heat of the moment. So always make a plan. And then you have the right to ask for what you need, right? So to asking if you're with a partner or partners about STI testing, like make sure that you feel like you can do that. Um, you can talk about safer sex methods, all of that, like what's the safest possible way to have sex. Um, and then again, you have the right to control your body and your sexual experiences. Power dynamics can be super tricky. Also, like I said, like in general, most sexual health is like pretty heteronormative, pretty like male, female, this and that. So making sure that you have access to resources. Um, I will show you like some of our resources. And then if you pop into, who knows where that health center is? Yeah. Yeah, right across the way. So if you go across into the admin building, the health center is like, if you walk straight out that way, right, it's right to the left there in room 111. If you go a little bit past that, there's like a whole circular thing. And I have like all different sexual health things. So I have like sexual health um, for, you know, like all different types of sexual activity. I have sexual health conversations. I have different barrier methods. I'm in the room 126 right around the corner. If you ever have questions, you can come talk to me. Um, I love talking with students and seeing what they need. Um, and so I will just say, more Park College Student Health Center, great resource. Free condoms, free STI testing, or low cost with some things. Uh, you can get pap smears. You can get sexual organ wellness exams. So we talk about pap smears, but who knows when you're supposed to start screening for testicular cancer if you have testes? Yeah. Yeah, so at 15. So I have a brochure on that. So you pop by, get a brochure on that. So 15, it's actually like one of the most common forms of cancer um, in the younger range for people with testes. Um, birth control uh, online. Has anyone been to our online website? So we also, like I have a bunch of resources I'm updating there. So in the sexual health, like there's different resources, different inclusive resources. Safe Zone's also a good one that has like some more inclusive resources. So all of this you can get to from our main website and then work your way through there. Um, I didn't bring my stickers, but I, I will give your instructor some stickers in case that scan to our website. Um, and then so before we kind of wrap up and end, um, if you have a phone and you're able to scan the QR code, I just like to know how this was for you. Uh, also, we can talk about it for a second. How, what do we feel? Do we feel like we got what we needed? Do we learn anything today? Overall, better, worse? I mean, like I said, you got to start off 8.30 a.m. talking about sex. It's going to be a good day, right? And let me know if you have any questions. Like I said, I was like talking to people. Or if you feel like we don't have a resource you want or you need, let me know. As a health educator, I try to make new resources. So just feel free to email me or let me know or pop over. Like I said, Monday through Thursday, I'm in room 126 in the admin building. Yeah. So you said you have like what pamphlets yeah. and stuff about the different subjects? Yeah, yeah. Um, Go. Tons of pamphlets. Um, and I'm also, like I said, I'm happy to make new pamphlets. So if there's like, I wish I, I wish this was out there. Like these are as like college health people, these are all things we talk about and it's not awkward or super weird or anything like that. But I think sometimes it can feel like hard to talk about those things coming into college, but this is what our health center does. Um, so yeah, pamphlets are in the admin building and the circle thing uh, right next to the bulletin board. But also let me know. And then, yeah. After the survey,
I think that's, let me just make sure. Any questions? Comments? And so that hour just flew by. <laughs> Who knew? Yeah. It's in the admin building. Yeah, admin building 111, room 111. So you just go up the stairs, you turn left, it's right there. That's where if you wanted to like grab. Also our self-help center is more than condoms. We have like Tylenol, things like that. So you could grab that. You can make an appointment. Uh, we have mental health and physical health. Um, what would you say in general? What would be in this age range the biggest barrier to SDI testing? What would we say as a class? I always like to ask classes this at the end. Yeah. Sort of the social taboo. The social taboo. Yeah. Yeah. Knowledge. Yeah. Knowledge slash, I don't want to know. <laughs> slash, so, yeah. Anything else that's like a barrier to SDI testing? Yeah. Yes. Yes. They're still involved. That's amazing that you brought that up. The health center, nothing goes to your parents. It all stays here. It doesn't transfer anywhere. Like nothing. There's no insurance required. We don't call home and say like, oh, so-and-so's SDI testing is in. Like, so it all stays here with us at the S at the health center. So that's kind of cool. Any other like barriers that we think of? Like I said, we're college health, so this is like what we do. We see a lot of it, so like we've seen it all. <laughs> so definitely that social taboo doesn't, you know, don't feel like that's a thing there. Uh, we also try to be like a super inclusive health center. So feeling, I know that can be a barrier, feeling like, oh, I don't know if they, I can talk about this with people. Um, so all of those things. But yeah, any other questions or comments? Like I said, I'll be, usually my door's closed, but if you just knock, I'm always happy to chat. So, but yeah. 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 That's a good. So we, so, so we don't even deal with the insurance part of things. And so that's, what's like in the real world, understanding insurance and rights and actually like starting at age 12, you can have your own autonomy over your sexual health, which people don't know also. Um, but yeah, so at the health center, insurance isn't a thing. The only thing for like all of this to be free for sexual health specifically is that we like enroll in family pact. But again, that doesn't go home. That doesn't like that's not like a thing that, uh, you know, gets associated with parents or anything. Even on their support alert. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Unless you hack them. <laughs> yeah. That's a really good thing. So I'm glad we talked about privacy. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad we talked about privacy and all of that. But yeah, as soon as everyone, if there's no other questions, I'll hang out for a minute. Um, but it was really great to be here with all of you. Thank you so much. Any other questions? If not, feel free to leave. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I just have to figure out how to operate this thing. Just... Thank you. Okay. Uh,